Cloud is growing 50% every year and the enterprise world is going multi-cloud. More than ever before, it's very important to understand and learn multiple clouds, AWS, Azure and the Google Cloud platform. I'm Ranga Karnam. I'm the founder of In 28 Minutes and creator of some of the world's most popular courses on cloud and DevOps. I've helped more than 600,000 learners around the world acquire new technology skills. Rest assured, you are in good hands. In this course, you will learn Azure from zero. If you have some experience with the cloud before, AWS for instance, that's cool. You can build on it during the course. If you do not have any experience with the cloud, that's awesome too. You can start your cloud journey with one of the most amazing cloud platforms, Azure. Certification courses can be boring with tons of theory and zero practice. I'm a great believer that the best way to learn is by doing. And we designed this course to be really hands-on. You'll play with a number of Azure services. You'll be exposed to a number of modern architecture trends, serverless, microservices, containers, container orchestration, and Kubernetes. By the end of the course, you'll be all ready for your AZ900 Azure Fundamentals exam. Are you ready to take your first steps into the cloud with Azure? What are you waiting for? Join me on this exciting journey right now. I'll see you in the course. Welcome back. I'm Ranga Karnam. I'm all excited to be your instructor for this course. Azure has more than 200 services. A little later in the course, we'll be logging into Azure portal and you'll be able to see all the different services which are present in Azure. When I started with Azure a few years back, there were half the number of services you are seeing right now. This is an ever-growing list of services. This specific exam expects you to have knowledge of 40 plus services. This exam tests your decision-making abilities. Which service do you choose in which situation? This course is designed to help you make those choices. Our goal with this course is not only to help you get certified, but also to help you understand cloud computing and understand the various Azure services in depth. We would want you to be able to take the knowledge you gained in this course and apply it in your real world projects. How can you make the best use of this course? How can you put your best foot forward? This is a very challenging certification. This expects you to understand and remember a number of services. You are human, I am human, and as humans, we tend to forget things over time. If I am learning something new today, it is highly probable that I will be forgetting it in a week's time. How do you ensure that you improve your chances of remembering things? Here are a couple of recommendations based on my experience. Number one is active learning. Think and take notes. Whenever you see something interesting in the course, write it down. The second recommendation is to review the presentation once in a while, every few days or every week. Take a step back, review the presentation and videos and think about what you have learned. The more you are actively involved with the learning and the more you review, the higher the chances for you to remember things for a long time. Now, what is our approach to building a great course? We are taking a three-pronged approach. We have amazing video presentations where we would introduce the different Azure services to you. We also have designed a number of amazing demos where you'll be playing with the Azure services. We also have two different kinds of quizzes to reinforce your learning. We have the traditional text quizzes where you have questions, multiple choice answers, and you pick the right answer. We also have video quizzes where we discuss the scenarios, solutions, and the different variations that are possible on the solution. By using this three-pronged approach, we think you'll be able to remember things for a long time and you will do really, really well at the exam. Now, before we move into the next step, there are a couple of recommendations for you. Number one, this is not a race. Take your time, focus on understanding things well and do not hesitate to replay videos when needed. The second, but the most important recommendation is to have fun. Preparing for certifications can get really boring and that's why we have invested a lot of time to try and make this course really interactive, really hands-on and making sure that you will have a lot of fun while you learn. I'm really excited to help you get Azure certified and I'll see you in the next step. Welcome back. In this step, let's understand what is cloud and why do we need the cloud? Let's consider a couple of use cases. Let's start with an online shopping application. What is the challenge that an online shopping application faces? Online shopping applications typically have peak usage during holidays and weekends. For example, during the Christmas period and the New Year period, you'd have a lot of load on the application. 
And rest of the time, you will have low loads on the application. Now, what was the solution before the cloud? The solution before the cloud was to do peak load provisioning. What is peak load provisioning? It is to buy infrastructure or procure infrastructure for the peak load. So if this is the peak load you expect, you would buy infrastructure to support that kind of a load. Now, think about this. What would that infrastructure be doing in periods of low load? It would just be sitting idle. Now, let's consider another example. Take a startup. What is the challenge that it faces? This challenge is also kind of a good news. The startup suddenly becomes popular. But what do you need is more infrastructure to support the load. How do you handle the sudden increase in the load? What was the solution before the cloud? Again, it was to procure infrastructure, assuming that you would be successful. And what if you are not really successful? All the infrastructure that you bought is wasted. So the typical challenges before the emergence of cloud were the high cost of procuring infrastructure. If you want to buy infrastructure ahead of time, it is very expensive. And it also needs ahead of time planning. Can you really guess the future? Can you accurately estimate the peak load? The other challenge is low infrastructure utilization. You can do peak load provisioning and buy infrastructure for the peak load. But during the rest of the time, the infrastructure is wasted. You have low infrastructure utilization. And you need a dedicated infrastructure maintenance team to maintain this infrastructure. Think about a startup. Can they afford a dedicated infrastructure maintenance team? And because of these challenges, we started moving towards the cloud. Whenever we use the cloud, we are talking about a simple question. How about provisioning or renting resources when we want them? and releasing them back to the cloud when you do not need them. This is also called on-demand resource provisioning. If you have high load on your application, if you have huge number of users using the application, you'll provision or you'll rent a lot of resources from the cloud. And once the load goes down, once the number of users on your application goes down, you'll release the resources back to the cloud. You can see that the number of resources you use increases with the number of users who are using the application. And that's why this is also called elasticity. Now, what are the advantages of this approach? You're trading capital expense for variable expense. Instead of investing money ahead of time, you are paying rent. You can benefit from the massive economies of scale. Each of the popular cloud providers have millions of servers. And therefore, they can get the best deals from the hardware providers. And because the cloud space is very competitive, the cloud providers pass on that advantage to their customers. That's us. The other advantage is that you don't really need to guess capacity anymore. If the number of users increase, you can provision more servers. If the number of users goes down, you can release them back to the cloud. So you don't really need to guess capacity anymore. And you don't really need to spend any money running and maintaining your data centers. The other big advantage is that you can go global in minutes. Imagine a startup in India. They can easily deploy an application to multiple regions around the world with a click of a button. And that's what cloud enables. We have now looked at some of the important advantages of the cloud. Now, where does Azure fit in? Azure is one of the top three cloud service providers. The other two are AWS, Amazon Web Services, and GCP, Google Cloud Platform. Azure provides 200 plus services and over the last few years, Azure has proved to be reliable, secure, and cost-effective. This course is all about Azure. So there is a lot that you will learn about Azure as we go further. We go to the cloud because of on-demand resource provisioning. And Azure is one of the top three cloud service providers. And our goal with this course is to help you learn Azure. Is there a best path to learn Azure? Whenever we talk about cloud applications, they make use of a number of cloud services. There is no single path to learn these services independently. However, what we have done is we have done a lot of research and worked out a very, very simple path for introducing all these services to you step by step. And that's what we would start doing starting the next step. In the next step, let's get started with setting up your Azure account. I'm really excited to help you learn Azure and I'll see you in the next step. Welcome back. In the previous step, we talked about the fact that setting up data centers in different regions around the world is not easy. And that's where all the cloud providers, including Azure, provide us with regions all around the world. 
Azure provides 60 plus regions around the world, which is an ever expanding list. There are new regions added in every year. Azure is the cloud provider which provides the most number of regions around the world. Now, what is a region? A region is nothing but a specific geographical location where we can host our resources. You can decide, I want to host my application in Mumbai region, or I can say, I want to host my application in London region or Sydney region. By having multiple regions around the world, Azure makes it very, very easy for us to deploy applications to these regions. The important advantage of having multiple regions around the world is high availability. If you deploy your application to multiple regions around the world, even if one of the regions is down, you can serve the application from the other regions. Number two is low latency. You can serve users from the nearest region to them and therefore they get low latency. Number three is global footprint. A startup in India might be able to easily deploy applications to multiple parts of the world and therefore it can create global applications. The last advantage is adherence to global regulations. Different countries have different regulations. For example, let's say United States of America or USA want the data related to all its citizens to reside only within their country. In those kind of situations, we can create a region in US and store data related to US customers only in that specific region. So regions help us achieve high availability, low latency, global footprint, and help us to adhere to government regulations. What is the need for zones? How do you achieve high availability in the same region? That's where availability zones are very useful. Azure provides multiple availability zones in some of the regions. Each availability zone is one or more discrete data centers. Each availability zone has independent and redundant power, networking and connectivity. So the chance that two availability zones simultaneously fail is very, very rare. All the availability zones in a region are connected through low latency links. So you'll not have a high performance impact when you deploy applications across multiple availability zones. The biggest advantage of having multiple availability zones is increased availability and fault tolerance within the same region. Even if one of the data centers completely fails, your application will still be available if you are deploying to multiple availability zones. One of the most important things to remember is that not all Azure regions have availability zones. Some of the Azure regions have no availability zones at all. Some of the Azure regions have three availability zones. Let's look at a few examples of regions and availability zones. East US has three availability zones. West Europe has three availability zones as well. Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific has three availability zones. Brazil South has three availability zones as well. West Central US has zero availability zones. As you can see, Azure offers a number of regions around the world and some of them have availability zones and some of them do not have availability zones. In this step, we got introduced to the concept of regions and zones. I'll see you in the next step. Welcome back. Let's get started with a very, very important Azure service called the Azure Virtual Machines. Where do you typically deploy your applications? Typically, you deploy them to servers. When you want to deploy applications in the cloud, you would need virtual servers. And that's what Azure Virtual Machines helps you to provision in Azure. Let's get started with Azure Virtual Machines in this specific step. In the corporate data centers, applications are deployed to physical servers. Where do you deploy applications to? In the cloud. In the cloud, we would rent virtual servers. Virtual machines are the virtual servers in Azure. How do you provision virtual machines? The service you would make use of is Azure Virtual Machines. Google calls it Compute Engine, AWS calls it EC2 or Elastic Compute Cloud, but Azure keeps it very simple. To provision VMs in Azure, you make use of Azure Virtual Machines. What are the features that Azure Virtual Machines offer? It helps you to create and manage the lifecycle of your virtual machine instances. You can create, start, stop, restart, or terminate your VM instances. You can also implement load balancing and auto scaling for multiple VM instances. If your application is deployed to multiple VM instances, you'd want to have a load balancer to distribute the load between them. And you'd also want to be able to do auto scaling. You'd want to be able to increase the number of instances based on the load. If you have a lot of users using the application, then you would want to increase the number of instances. 
Otherwise, you'd want to decrease the number of instances. Azure Virtual Machines also allows you to attach disks to your virtual machine instances. You'd want to run your operating system on a hard disk and attach it with your virtual machine. Azure Virtual Machines also allows you to manage the network connectivity and configuration for your VM instances. You'd want to assign a public IP address for your VM instance and you'd want to be able to use that IP address to talk to your virtual machine. So Azure Virtual Machine enables you to manage the lifecycle of your virtual machine instances. It provides you with a number of additional features like attaching storage, load balancing, auto scaling, and managing the network connectivity to your virtual machine instances. Now, I'm sure you're getting bored with all the theory I'm talking about. What we'll do in the next few steps is to set up a set of VM instances as web servers, and we will distribute load between them using load balancers. In this quick step, we were introduced to Azure Virtual Machines. Let's start playing with Azure Virtual Machines in the next step. Let's get started with a hands-on for Azure Virtual Machines, where we would create a few virtual machine instances and play with them. Let's get started. If you go to portal.azure.com and sign in with the user ID and password that we created earlier, you would see a page like this. It says, welcome to Microsoft Azure. You can either do a tour or you can say maybe later and we can go ahead and start creating virtual machines. What are we seeing in here is called Azure Portal. There are a number of services which are present in Azure. You can click this icon which is present on the left top corner and you'd be able to see a wide variety of services which are present in Azure. Let's not really worry about all of them. For now, let's focus on virtual machines. What you can do is either click virtual machines in here or you can also type in virtual machines. So I would type in virtual machines and go in there. What you want to do is to create a virtual machine. So I'll go ahead and say add and select virtual machine option from here. So we'd want to add a virtual machine. The page would take a couple of seconds to load. Now let's see what is involved in creating a virtual machine. Right now we are in the free trial. That's what is called a subscription. And in the free trial subscription, we would want to create a resource group. A virtual machine is a resource. A database is a resource. There might be a number of resources which are related to a single project or a single business unit. You'd want to group them in some way. In Azure, the way you can group them is by creating a resource group. If you have a virtual machine, a database, and maybe a queue which is related to the same project, you can create a resource group and you can put all these resources under the same resource group. For now, what we would do is we would create a new resource group. And I will call this compute-rg. Right now we are exploring all the compute services. So I would actually put it as compute-rg and I'll say OK. So we are creating a new resource group, compute-rg. The next thing that we need to configure is the name for a virtual machine. I'll call this my first VM. Now, after that, there are three very important choices that we would typically need to make. Number one is region. Which region do you want to deploy this virtual machine to? Earlier, we talked about the fact that Azure offers 60 plus regions and you can deploy virtual machines to any of those regions. You, you can click this drop down and choose which region you would want to deploy your virtual machine to. I would recommend you to choose the default one, which is US East US. The second important choice that you need to make is what operating system do you want on your virtual machine? You select the operating system by choosing the image. There are a wide variety of images which are offered. You can see Ubuntu, Red Hat Linux, Windows Server. There are a wide variety of operating systems which are supported. What I would recommend you to do is to choose the default one which is suggested, which is Ubuntu Server 18.04 long-term support. The third important decision that you need to make when creating a virtual machine is the size of the virtual machine. How big should your virtual machine be? There are a wide variety of sizes which are present. Once you click the drop down, you can choose the sizes which is recommended in here or you can say see all sizes and look at a wide variety of VM sizes which are offered by Azure. If you do a Google for Azure free tire and click the link which comes up in here, this is what we used to create the Azure account earlier. 
If you scroll down, you can see products which are free for 12 months up to a monthly limit. Over here, you can see that under Linux virtual machines, you have 750 hours free of B1S standard tire. So what we'll do is we'll use this machine type because this comes free for us. So let's go over there and say select a VM size. You can type in B1S and then this is filtered down or you can even scroll and choose there. If you are able to select one of the rows and then go and select B1S, it's in here. You can see that B1S has one vCPU and one gig of RAM and you can have up to two data disks which are attached with it. For all our demos, that should be more than sufficient. So let's make use of B1S and I'll say select. So the three important choices that we have made until now are one, the region, where do you want to run the virtual machine? Number two is image, what OS do you want to make use of? Number three is the size. What is the hardware you'd want to make use of to run your virtual machine? Right now we chose one vCPU and one gig of memory. Now over here, if you further scroll down, you can choose how you'd want to authenticate yourself when you're trying to access the virtual machine. What I would recommend you to do is to do SSH public key. So let's use SSH public key. I'll leave the username at default. What I would do is I would generate a new key pair. So we'll generate a new key pair and let's have the key pair name as my first VM underscore key. That's the default which is suggested. If you scroll down further, you can also configure what are the inbound ports which are allowed. I'm creating a virtual machine. What are the ports on which I can access the virtual machine from outside? Right now you can see that by default, SSH on port 22 is allowed. What I would want to do is to add one more port. So I'll click the drop down and I'll check HTTP view. What we want to do later is to install a web application on this specific virtual machine. And therefore I would want to enable HTTP and SSH. So we would want to be able to access this virtual machine on port 22, that is SSH and port 80, which is to access a web application. And now we are all set to create our first virtual machine. What we would do is we would go ahead and say review and create. There is a lot of advanced configuration that you can customize when you create a virtual machine. Let's not worry about it. To start with, let's focus on the basics and let's try and create a virtual machine. Whenever we create a resource, Azure would validate our resource configuration. And that's what is happening in the background right now. It's running a final validation of our virtual machine configuration. It says validation passed. And now we can go ahead and create this virtual machine. Once you click create, you should see a pop-up where you can actually download the private key. We have created an SSH key and we can download the private key and store it. So let's download the private key. Make sure that you download it and have it in a safe place because we would be making use of this file in the next step. I would say LF, I would want to download. And this key is now downloaded into the downloads folder in my machine. A very important warning, do not share that key pair with anybody because anybody who has that key pair will be able to access your virtual machine. So keep it private. The creation of the virtual machine is right now in progress. You can see that the deployment is right now in progress. Let's wait for a few minutes and I'll see you in the next step. Welcome back. In the previous step, we started deploying our virtual machine. It took a couple of minutes and the virtual machine is now ready. It says your deployment is complete. You can see the power of the cloud. I'm right now in India and within minutes, I was able to deploy a virtual machine to a location in the east of United States. That's the power cloud provides you with. You can easily deploy your applications to multiple regions around the world. Now, what I would do over here is to say, go to resource. This would take us to the virtual machine, which was created. The other option of getting to the virtual machine is to just type in my first VM. So you can type in my first VM and in the resources, you should see the VM that we have created and you can choose that and come in here. The other option would be to just say virtual machines. So search for virtual machines. It would give you a list of virtual machines. You can see all the details of the specific virtual machine we have created, which is my first VM. You can see the subscription. You can see the resource group. You can see where it is created. You can see the status, which is running. You can see the operating system, which is Linux. And you can see the size, which is standard B1S. 
You can also see a public IP address which is assigned to this specific virtual machine. Once you click in, you'll also be able to perform a number of operations. You can restart it, you can stop it, you can delete it if you'd want. And you can see a lot of details about this specific virtual machine. Now that we have a virtual machine running, what we want to do is to be able to SSH into it, to be able to connect to it and run a few commands against it. How do we do that? The way we can do that is by clicking connect. So once you click connect in here, you can choose how you'd want to connect. What we have created is a Linux virtual machine. And the way we can connect to Linux virtual machines is by doing SSH. So I'll say SSH and it would show a few details around how we can connect using SSH. And to be able to SSH into this virtual machine, what we'll do is we'll make use of a command line utility which Azure provides us with. In addition to Azure portal, which is the UI, in the Azure portal, you also have Cloud Shell. Cloud Shell can be used to execute commands from the command line. If you want to do an SSH, and one of the options to do an SSH is from the command line. The screen now says, welcome to Azure Cloud Shell. There are two shells which are supported by Azure Cloud Shell. One is called Bash and the other one is called PowerShell. Bash is typically used on Linux and PowerShell is typically used on Windows. What we'll do now is to choose Bash. As it says in here, Azure Cloud Shell requires an Azure file share to persist files. Let's use the free trial subscription and let's go ahead and say create storage. Once you do that, you would see that you would be logged in into terminal. Now, what we want to do is to be able to SSH into the virtual machine. And to be able to SSH into the virtual machine, we would need to have the private key. Do we have the private key with us? Yes, it's in our downloads folder. What we would need to first do is to upload the file from the downloads folder to Azure Cloud Shell. How can we do that? I can click upload download files in here. Go ahead and click this and say upload. And, and if I go over to the downloads folder, you should see the file in here. This is the key file which we downloaded earlier. So I'll say choose for upload. So what would happen now is the file would be uploaded. And you can see the status right now that it's complete. So if I go ahead here and say ls, it would say my first vm underscore key dot pem that's cool let's follow the instructions which are present in here right now over here connect via ssh with client it says open the client of your choice we are making use of azure shell we are making use of bash and what we want to first do is to ensure you have read only access to the private key the way you can do that is the command which is present in here you can exactly type in the command which you can see in there chmod 400 and instead of azure user.pem what we would want to do is to use the key file which is present in here you can copy this control c or command c and paste it in so change mode my first vm underscore key dot pem so this would change the mode and now i can use this private key to do ssh and the command to be able to do that is also present in here so ssh hyphen i the path to the key path Azure user at this specific thing. All these commands might look complex, but actually they are very, very simple to execute. All that you need to do is to follow the instructions. So SSH hyphen I, you can see that in here, the private key path, where is it present? My first VM underscore key dot PM. That's cool. And last one, which you would want to do is let's copy this in here. Azure user is the username at the public IP of the VM, which is 1390-3580. You might have a different value. What I would recommend you to do is to copy whatever is present in here. So control C and control V and press enter. You can see that it's saying, do you want to connect to it? Yes, I would want to connect to it. So you can enter Y or yes. Oops, it's asking me to enter yes. So let's go ahead and say yes. And Cool. We are now connected to our my first VM. Let's type in who am I? Who am I gives the username Azure user. Let's check if Python is installed over here. Python hyphen hyphen version. 
there is Python 2.7 which is installed over here. Let's try and print host name. What's the host name? My first VM. That's the name that we have given to this specific virtual machine. Let's type in host name hyphen i. So host name hyphen i would give the IP address of this specific host. In this step, we were able to quickly connect to the virtual machine and execute a few commands. Let's play with this a little bit more in the subsequent steps. I'll see you in the next step. Welcome back. In the last step, we were able to create a virtual machine and we were able to SSH into it. Let's quickly look at some of the important concepts that are related to Azure Virtual Machines. The first important concept is that of an image. Image helps you to choose the right operating system and the software for your virtual machine. What is the image that we used earlier? Right click on the virtual machines and open it in new tab. So I have the first tab where we have the my first virtual machine and the second tab where we are now exploring the virtual machines. And now over here, let's do an add, add virtual machine. Where did we choose the image? The image is what we chose in here. There are a wide variety of operating systems which are present in here. If you want to run Red Hat Linux, this is the image you'd want to make use of. If you want to run, let's say Windows Server, you can scroll down and choose the specific version that you'd want to make use of. If you want to run Windows 10, then you can go ahead and choose Windows 10 as well. So the image is the one which decides what operating system is used on the virtual machine. The second important concept is that of a virtual machine family. What is a virtual machine family? There might be different kinds of applications that you would want to run on your virtual machine. You might have a general purpose web application or you might be using the virtual machine as a cache. If you are using virtual machine as a cache, you need a lot of memory. In that kind of situation, you would want to make use of memory optimized instances. You might be running a high performance compute workload. In those kind of situations, you would want to make use of a HPC. You might be running a graphics application on your VM. In those kind of situations, you might want to choose a GPU based hardware. So a VM family is the thing that helps us to choose the right family of hardware for your specific application that we want to run on the virtual machine. So if you go in here and scroll down a little over here, when we chose the size, if you click see all sizes, this is where you can see the family. You can see that the one which you are making use of B1S is general purpose. If you select one of these and if you start scrolling down, you should be able to see other types. So you can see that the D series is recommended for general purpose workloads. There is a B series, there is an A series, which is recommended for development or test workloads. There is also E series. And if you expand E series, you can see that this is memory optimized. So these are recommended for high memory workloads. And within the same family, there are different sizes. Let's expand the B series and you'd see that there are different B series sizes which are present in here. There is B1S, that is the one which we are making use of right now. You have B2S, you have B2MS, B1LS, B1MS. You can see that each one of these have different number of vCPUs and RAM. And each of these can have different number of data disks that can be attached with them. So a VM size helps you to choose the right quantity of hardware. I would want to use two vCPUs and four GB of memory. How do I get that? I can choose the right VM size. So the operating system, image. The hardware, you would choose the right VM family and within the family, you would choose the right VM size. To your virtual machines, you can also attach virtual disks. This is very, very similar to attaching a hard disk to your laptop or computer. Where is the disk that is attached to our virtual machine? Let's search for that. Search for disks. And go to disks. You can see that there is a disk which is created. So my first VM, whenever I'm creating a virtual machine, by default, it needs to be able to run an operating system. And the operating system runs from a boot disk. And this is the boot disk which is attached by, a, by default with our virtual machine. You can see that the default size for this is 30 GB. Now, how can you configure this? How can you add more disks when you create a virtual machine? Let's go back to virtual machines. Let's go back to add virtual machine 
and go to disks. This is where you can actually choose the size of the default disk. And if you want, you can add new data disks. So this is the boot disk which is needed to run your operating system. And this is where you can configure additional data disks that you would want to attach with your virtual machine. So to your virtual machine, you can easily attach disks as well. In this step, we looked at four very, very important concepts that you need to know about virtual machines. One is what is the operating system that is image? What is the hardware? That's a combination of VM family and VM size. And how do you attach virtual disks with your virtual machines? That is by configuring disks. I'm sure you're having a wonderful time and I'll see you in the next step. Welcome back. In this step, let's try and install simple software on our virtual machine. In a previous step, we connected to the virtual machine and we were able to execute a few commands. So who am I, for example, is a command that we executed earlier. Now, before I do anything more in the command prompt, what I would do is to maximize it. And I would also go to settings and increasing and increase the text size to large. So that it's very, very clear for you. I'll go ahead and do a clear and let's go ahead and install some software here. To make things easy, I've made a few useful commands available in the PPT as well. The first one that we would execute is sudo su. So sudo su, su, this is to become a super user. You want to install software. So we'll become a super user before we would install software. And the next thing that we would want to do is to update the package index. We want to pull the latest changes from all the repositories. And to be able to do that, what we'll do is to execute a command app get hyphen y update. So let's go ahead and execute that app get hyphen y update. App get is a package manager and we are updating the package index for app get. Now that the package index is updated, let's go ahead and install our web server. If you are familiar with Nginx, Nginx is a popular HTTP server. What we want to do is to install Nginx. And the way we can install Nginx is very, very simple. apt hyphen get hyphen y install Nginx. Let's use this now and run this. So apt get hyphen i install Nginx. So this would install Nginx on our virtual machine. It will also launch it up. The installation is taking a little while. It took about 30 seconds, I think. And at the end of it, everything's fine. Now I'd want to find out the public IP address of the virtual machine. The easiest way to get it is go to virtual machines. So I have one tab where I have the bash open and the other tab where I am looking at the UI. And this is where you have the public IP address. So I can copy the public IP address and 1390 You can see the welcome page for Nginx come up. You can see that Nginx is successfully installed. Now, what I would want to do is to customize this home page. I want to customize this home page and show whatever I would want to show. And the way we can do that is by using a specific command, echo hello world and send it to a specific path. The first thing that we would do is to just say echo hello world. What would it do? It would echo hello world to the console. What I would want to do is to pipe this. So I would want to pipe this. I would want to send this to a specific file. So var www.html slash index.html. So let's go ahead and copy it in here. So slash var slash www slash html slash index.html and press enter. And now you can go and refresh the public IP address again. You can see hello world in here. If you want, you can change it and probably say hello world from in 28 minutes and you can go in and refresh over here and it says hello world from in 28 minutes now over here instead of in 28 minutes i can probably put the host name so i want to put my first vm in here over here i would want to print the host name i can say host name and inside echo if i would want to print the host name i can use dollar open parenthesis i can type in host name close parenthesis and double quote. This would print my first VM. And let's say I would want to print hello world from the host name. And this is what I would want to actually send it out to this. So let's pipe it to 
this. What would we see now if I refresh this? It says hello world from my first VM. So in this step, we were able to successfully install Nginx on our virtual machine and we were able to quickly customize the application which we would want to run from Nginx. The application which we are deploying right now is kind of a simple hello world application. But the important thing that you need to focus on is the power of the cloud. It enables you to provision virtual machines. It enables you to install software on it very, very easily. Now, one of the things that you would have already noticed is the approach that we are using to run this is very, very manual. I have to provision a virtual machine, SSH into it, and then execute a sequence of commands. And that's very, very slow. Is there an automated way of doing it? Can I get software installed on my virtual machine automatically? Let's start exploring that in the next step. Welcome back. In the previous steps, we created a virtual machine, we installed Nginx on it, and we were able to run a simple Hello World app from it. In this step, let's look at how you can automate the entire series of steps that we have done. I'll go back to virtual machines. And over here, what we want to do is to add a new virtual machine. So I want to add a new virtual machine. I would use the same resource group that we have used earlier. So I'll use compute resource group. I'll not create a new one. I'll use the, I'll reuse the existing one, which is compute RG. And I'll call this my second VM. So this is my second virtual machine. I'll choose the same things that we chose earlier. The image would be Ubuntu Server 18.04. The size would be B1S. For the SSH public key, what I would recommend you to do is to use the same key that we used earlier. What I would recommend you to do is to use existing key stored in Azure and select the key that we created earlier, which is my first VM key. So the key which we downloaded earlier can be reused for this specific instance as well. And the public inbound ports, what we'll do is we'll configure two of them. We'll say HTTP and SSH. And what we would do next is go to disks. Let's take the defaults in disk. Let's take the defaults in disks. Let's go to advanced. In advanced is where we can actually make use of something called cloud init. Earlier, we wanted to run these commands. And to be able to run these commands, we needed to SSH into the machine and then run the commands. Cloud init provides you a way to simplify that. What we can do is we can put a series of commands in here and these commands would be automatically executed at startup. To say that this is bash command, what we need to do is to add in a simple script like this in here. So we can add this. This is to say this is bash command. And what we want to do is execute these commands. So we want to do sudo su app get hyphen y update app get hyphen by install nginx. You can look at the previous steps and these commands should be, this entire script should be made available to you in the previous step in text format, or you can pick it up from the presentation as well. And what I would do is I'd pick up the last one where we have the host name. So what we are doing right now is at startup, we are installing nginx and then we are customizing the home page with the host name. I'd go ahead and say review and create. The validation has passed and now I can go ahead and say create. After a couple of minutes, I saw this, your deployment is complete. What I would do now is click go to resource and over here I can see the public IP. What I would do is copy the public IP the clipboard and I'll type it in and you should see welcome to in 28 minutes, my second VM. Where is this coming in from? This is the host name of the second VM. If you are having any problems with this, what I would recommend you to do is to wait for a couple of minutes. The initialization after a VM is launched would take a couple of minutes. What I would recommend you to do is to wait for it and then try it again. And then you should see this message come up. Right now we have both the first virtual machine and the second virtual machine up and running. If I go to the virtual machines and see the list of virtual machines right now. Oops, it's showing just one. Let's do a refresh. Yep, right now it shows two virtual machines. Now think about this. What if I would want to create 10, 15, 20 virtual machines? What if I would want to have 10 instances of my application? Would I be able to do all that manually? Wouldn't that be tiring? 
Let's see how to automate all that stuff starting the next step. Welcome back. Starting this step, let's look at a very, very important aspect of deploying applications to the cloud, which is availability. What is availability? Are the applications available when the users need them? Availability is a percentage of time an application provides the operations that are expected of it. A good example of availability is 99.99% availability. This is also called four nines availability. To understand the impact of four nines availability, let's look at a few examples. Let's look at the availability table. If you are asking for 99.95% availability, it would mean a downtime of just 22 minutes in a month. If you'd want an availability of four nines or 99.99%, you are looking at just about four minutes of downtime per month. This is very, very difficult to achieve because even to release a new version of the software, there would be some amount of downtime typically. Achieving four nines availability is tough, but that's what most online applications aim for. If you'd want five nines availability, that means 26 seconds of downtime in a month. This is really, really, really tough. With this in context, let's now look at the availability for your Azure virtual machines. Earlier, we created a couple of virtual machines. How do I increase the availability for them? If I'm deploying an application on them, how do I ensure that the applications are available? Let's look at some of the important availability metrics for your Azure virtual machines. If you have a single instance virtual machine, and you have created it with premium SSD or ultra disk, then you get 99.9% availability. What is premium SSD or ultra disk? We talked about the fact that virtual machines can be attached with disks. There are different types of disks which are present. Premium SSD, ultra disk, standard SSD, standard HDD, and based on the disk which is attached, the availability guarantee from Azure for your virtual machine varies. If you are attaching premium or ultra disk, it's 99.9%. If you are attaching standard SSD, the availability goes down 99.5. If you are attaching standard HDD hard disk drive, then it goes down even further 95%. Let's quickly see where you can see these disk types. You can go to add virtual machine and go to disks. And this is where you can see the different disk types. So right now we are making use of premium. You can also use standard SSD, standard HDD as well. As it says in here, ultra disk option is only available when we are making use of availability zones. We would look at how you can use availability zones a little later when we are playing with scale sets. Now, if you'd want to further increase the availability for your Azure VM, what you'd need to do is to create two or more instances in the same availability set. So if you create two VMs in the same availability set, the Availability increases from 99.9% to 99.95%. While the increase looks small, it is very, very important when it comes to online applications. So if you'd create two instances in an availability set, you get higher availability. But what is an availability set? Where can you configure it? Availability set is nothing but a logical grouping of virtual machines. Instead of creating single virtual machine, you'd want to create a logical group of a number of virtual machines. And whenever we are talking about availability sets, there are two important concepts, fault domains and update domains. Fault domains are nothing but a group of VMs sharing a common power source and network switch. If I have two VMs and both the VMs are deployed to the same fault domain, what would happen if the power source goes down? Both the VMs would be down. So for higher availability, you'd want to distribute your VMs across different fault domains. You don't want all your VMs to share the same common power source and network switch. The other important concept is update domains. These are group of VMs that are updated or rebooted at the same time. Any maintenance that is done on all the VMs in a single update domain, the maintenance would be done at the same time. If I have 10 VMs and all the 10 VMs are in the same update domain, what would happen? All of them would be updated at the same time. They might be rebooted and that would cause downtime in the application. And I don't want that as well. I would want to distribute the VMs across different update domains as well. 
So whenever we are creating VMs, we would want to distribute them across fault domains and across update domains so that all of them don't go down at the same time. And the way you can do that is by making use of an availability set. Where do you create an availability set? Let's go back to basics when we create a virtual machine and let's scroll down and over here you have availability options. And this is where you have the option to create a availability set. So I can go here and say, I would want to create an availability set. You can go ahead and create a new availability set right here. So you can say, I would want to create a new availability set and you can configure the name of the availability set and how many different fault domains and update domains you would want to make use of. So if I would want to create 10 VMs, probably I would choose five update domains and two different fault domains. If you have one fault domain and one update domain, then your availability will be low. However, if you increase the fault domains to either two or three and increase the number of update domains, let's say I would want five update domains or 10 update domains, then the chances that all the VMs would go down at the same time will go down substantially. So whenever you're creating a virtual machine, you can associate it with a availability set. If you have multiple virtual machines which are associated with the availability set, then the availability set would ensure that those virtual machines are distributed across different fault domains and update domains. To get even further higher availability, what you can do is to deploy two or more instances in two or more availability zones in the same Azure region. This gives you up to 99.99% availability. So over here, what we need to do is to deploy two or more instances in different availability zones. You don't even want them in the same availability zone. They have to be in separate availability zones. In summary, if you want high availability, you want to create multiple instances. If you create multiple instances in the same availability set, you get 99.95% availability. If you'd create the instances in two or more availability zones, then you'd get up to 99.99% availability. Let's say I would want to create multiple instances in multiple availability zones. How do I automate the creation of all that? That's what we'll be looking at in the next steps. I'll see you in the next step. Welcome back. Starting this step, let's look at virtual machine scale sets. How do you simplify the creation and management of multiple virtual machines? That's where we would go for virtual machine scale sets. This allows you to create and manage a group of Azure virtual machines. This provides high availability for your applications. In the previous step, we saw that if I create multiple VMs, I get higher availability. If I create multiple VMs across multiple availability zones, I get even higher availability. Virtual machine scale sets also allows you to add a load balancer. So if you have multiple Azure VMs, if you have your application deployed to them, you want to be able to load balance between those instances. Virtual machine scale sets also helps you to create a load balancer. It also helps you to distribute VM instances across multiple availability zones. As we discussed earlier, not all regions have multiple availability zones. Wherever you have multiple availability zones, you can use a scale set to distribute your VM instances across multiple availability zones. Virtual machine scale sets also supports manual scaling and auto scaling. Let's say I have five instances right now. I can increase it to 10, 15. I can do that manually. The other option I also have is auto scaling. Based on the number of requests which are coming in, I can increase the number of instances automatically. You can create up to 1000 virtual machine instances in a single scale set. If you go ahead and search for virtual machine scale sets. So if you search for virtual machine scale sets, you'll be able to pick it up. Until now we've been playing with virtual machines, right now we would want to create a scale set. So let's go ahead and select that. So scale sets, and this is where we would want to add a new scale set. So Azure virtual machine scale sets let you create and manage a group of load balanced VMs. The number of VM instances can automatically increase or decrease in response to demand or a defined schedule. This provides high availability to your applications. So a virtual machine scale set makes it very, very easy to manage, configure and update a large number of virtual machines. What we'll do is we'll choose the same resource group that we have been using until now, compute resource group. I want to give it a name of VM scale set one. 
let's choose the default region and the availability zones you can also choose specifically which availability zones you'd want to deploy your applications to what i would do is i would choose all the three zones if you scroll down you can choose the image and you can also choose the size and you can also choose the ssh key what i would do is to reuse the same thing that we created earlier so use existing key stored in azure and i would choose my first vm key so this is the same configuration that we have been doing until now except for the fact that we chose the region and the availability zones i'll click next to disks the specific thing i'm really interested in is networking so let's click next to networking there are two very important things that we would want to configure in networking one is the network interface whenever we are creating a scale set by default it would only create a private ip address for the virtual machines what we would want to do is to create a public ip address how do we do that the way we can do that is by going and clicking in this pencil icon in here so you can click that and i can say i'd want a public inbound port and i would say allow selected ports and i would say i would want to allow http traffic and i would also want to allow ssh into these virtual machines the machines that we are creating are test demo machines so it should not be a problem to allow ssh access into them and i will also enable public ip address for this so these two are very important settings that you need to enable so on the virtual machines what we are doing is we are enabling inbound traffic and we are enabling the creation of public ip address and i would say okay so on the network interface we enabled public ip addresses and we also enabled http traffic and ssh traffic into it in addition what i also want to do is to load balance between the vm instances i'll go ahead and configure a load balancer so use load balancer and we'll create a new load balancer so let's choose the azure load balancer and let's take the defaults with all the settings on the next page you can configure scaling you can either go for manual scaling or custom scaling manual scaling is you decide how many instances to run two instances 10 instances 20 instances if you go to custom you can also configure how you'd want to do the auto scaling you can say i would want to do auto scaling based on the cpu load so if the cpu load is greater than 75% i would want to add a new instance in so there are a lot of other metrics that you can configure in here so based on those metrics you can auto scale the number of instances based on the load which is coming in you can increase or decrease the number of instances for now i would choose manual and let's have the initial instance count as 2 from scaling let's go to advanced in advanced you can configure how many fault domains you want and also you can configure cloud in it i want to run these set of commands so let's go ahead and use them and paste them in here so sudo su app get o hyphen fi update install nginx and i'll remove the next two ones this is exactly the same things that we have configured for the second vm so sudo su app get y update app get hyphen y install nginx and welcome to in 28 minutes host name so this looks good let's go ahead and say review and create azure is running its final validation let's wait for it to complete cool the validation has passed so we have chosen the default region which is east us we have chosen three availability zones and we want two instances to be running we have enabled load balancing we have also enabled public ip addresses and we also have cloud in it configured all these things look good so let's go ahead and say create the deployment is right now in progress it would take it would take a few minutes for the deployment to complete i'll see you in the next step welcome back in this step let's quickly create a container instance how do we create a container instance you can just type in container instances in here so container instances so container instances is what we have picked up and i would want to create a container instance and you'd see that creating a container instance is very very easy as usual select the subscription resource group compute rg the container name i would say my first container instance and 
Outreach region as East US. Let's pick up one of the quick start images which is provided by Azure. So quick start images and let's use the hello world which is provided by Azure itself. And let's use the size which is selected by default in here. And after that, I can go ahead and set a view and create. It's running the final validation right now. This would take about a few seconds usually. So let's wait for it to complete. And right now I can go ahead and say create. The creation of the container instance would take a little while. What I would recommend you to do is to take a break and I'll see you on the other side. Welcome back. The creation of the scale set is successful now. Let's go to the resource. So the scale set is now created. You can see that the status is two out of two succeeded. Now to see the instances, we can go and say instances. And over here, you'd be able to see both the instances. If I click one of these instances, I can go in and I can see the public IP address of one of them. So let's go and copy that and run this. Cool. This is the VM scale 000. If you don't see this app, just wait for a few minutes. It, it would take typically four to five minutes before everything is set up. So if this is not working, then wait for a few minutes and then you should see this coming up. And if you go to the second instance, you'll also see that that also is up and running. So I'll copy the public IP address of that and put that in here. Cool, this is VM scale 0001. Now, in addition to the scale set, we also created a load balancer, right? So we wanted to load balance between the VM instances. We don't want to individually invoke these URLs. Where is that load balancer created? Let's go to load balancers. So let's go to load balancers and see if there is a load balancer created. Yep, this is the load balancer which is created. You can see the name of it matches that of the scale set, followed by hyphen LB. And if I go in there, you should have a IP address that's down here. So let's pick up the IP address from here and let's go and execute that. So you can go that this specific request is going to 001. So the load balancer is working to see the round robin thing in action. What I would do is I'll click this. So this is where we can actually launch up a cloud shell. We used a cloud shell earlier to execute a few commands. We SSH'd into the VM instance and executed a few commands. Let's now do a curl, C-U-R-L. And what do we want to curl to? The IP address of the load balancer. Oops, I want to do a C-U, I made a mistake. So let's do a C-U-R-L and the IP address 52.226.176.90. So that's what we are doing a curl, 0, 1, 0, 0. So over here, you can see that it's round robining. So welcome to in 28 minutes, 0001, 0000. So that's cool. And let's minimize this. Now I'll go over to the scale set. So let's go to the scale set. Scale set, virtual machine scale sets. And this is the scale set we would want. Let's say I go in to the instances and I would say delete. So I'm manually deleting the instance inside a scale set. Let's see what would happen. Let's do a refresh. You can see that instance zero is deleting. And now if I send a curl, you should see that every response is coming back only from instance one. So what we are doing right now is manual scaling. If you go to scaling, manual scale, you can also increase manually the number of instances as well. So right now, let's say I would want to scale it up to three instances. I can go in here and say I would want three instances and save this. You can see that I'm facing an error because in a region, I can only have four VM instances running by the quota. And right now I'm exceeding that. And that's the reason why what's happening is I'm unable to update it to three instances. So what I would actually do is go to the virtual machines. So let's go to virtual machines and let's delete the first VM. So let's actually go ahead and delete the my first VM and let's say yes. 
and say delete. Let's wait for this one to delete. Now if I go to scaling, I can see that the number of instances right now is one. If I would want, I can increase it back to two and I can say save. So you can increase the number of instances. Let's say if you want to further increase it to five or six, you can do that in here as well. Now, if I go back to instances and click refresh, I should see that there is a new VM which is created. And if I actually do a curl to the load balancer, within a little while, you'd see that you'd get responses back from that instance as well. Right now, I'm not yet getting responses back from that instance. Cool. I started getting responses back from VM scale set one four instance as well. As you can see in here, scale sets makes it very, very easy to manage multiple VM instances. We saw that creating a scale set was very, very easy. And along with the scale set, we also created a load balancer. And the load balancer is now actually load balancing between those two active instances. If I go to the load balancer, now whenever we talk about a load balancer, load balancers have typically a front end and a back end. The front end of this load balancer is the IP address to which we are sending the request to. So this is the IP address which we are sending the request to and that's what is the front end IP configuration. Once a request comes in at this specific IP address, it would be routed to the back ends. Where are the back ends? The back ends are nothing but the scale set. So we have created a scale set with two instances. Whatever instances are part of that scale set will be the back end pool. All those instances we would distribute the load to. We have asked the scale set to create instances in multiple availability zones. And you can see that these two are created in two different availability zones. In this and the previous steps, we looked at scale set. Scale set simplify the creation and management of multiple VMs. We can add a load balancer. We can enable manual scaling and auto scaling. And we can distribute VM instances across multiple availability zones by using a scale set. I'm sure you're having a wonderful time and I'll see you in the next step. Welcome back. In this step, let's explore a few more features around Azure Virtual Machines. Static IP address. What is the need for a static IP address? Let's go over to Virtual Machines. Let's pick up the second virtual machine. I've terminated the first virtual machine a little while back. What I would do is I would note down the public IP address of this. So this is the public IP address right now. Close the other browsers which I have and I'll run this. So you can see that this is responding back right now. One of the important things that you need to understand is public IP addresses are not free. Every public IP address that you create has a charge associated with it. What I'll do now is I'll go ahead and stop this instance. So I'll say stop the virtual machine. When I kept refreshing this, I was not able to see the stop kicking in. What I had to do was to refresh the entire page. And then I was able to see the status update to stopped. Once the instance is stopped, you can see that the public IP address is lost. What I'll do now is I'll select this and I'll say start. So I would want to start the selected virtual machines. Let's click start there as well. If you want to see the status of the things which you are doing right now, you can go to notifications. You can go in here and see what are the different events which are happening in here. All these events are coming in from something called an activity log. You can see that the execute start command is running on one selected items. And let's close this and let's do a refresh again. Yep, it's in running status. Oops, I cannot see the public IP address. Let's do a refresh. It took a little while before I can see the new public address in here. If you don't want the public IP address of a virtual machine to change, in those kind of situations, you can assign a static IP address. How can you do that? Let's see how you can do that when creating a new virtual machine. Let's say add virtual machine. And over here, go over to networking. And this is where you can actually create a new public IP. So let's say create new IP. Oops, before that I would need to select a subscription. So let's go ahead and select a resource group. And let's go back to networking. And over here, let's create a new public IP. And over here you can assign 
that it should be static. When you create a static IP address, that IP address will not change. So what we are seeing is the fact that public IP addresses are of two kinds, dynamic and static. Dynamic changes every time you stop and start, static remains constant. So a static IP address is a fixed IP address that can be assigned to your VM. Important thing to remember is public IP addresses, whether they are dynamic or static, they are charged per IP address per hour. So if you have unused IP addresses, the best practice is to release them as soon as possible. The next important feature that we'll be looking at is Azure monitoring. What is Azure monitoring used for? Let's pick up the second VM. Let's say unsaved edits will be discarded. That's okay. It's okay. Over here, if you go to monitoring, you can see a lot of metrics around that specific virtual machine. Let's go to six hours and you can see the CPU usage over a period of time. You can see the network. You can see the network usage over here. You can see the disk bytes, disk operations. So you can see all the metrics around your VMs. Where are these metrics coming in from? These metrics are coming in from Azure Monitor. The other option you have to see the metrics is to go to monitoring. So once inside the virtual machine, you can go into monitoring and also go to metrics. Over here, you can also create charts and visualize all the metrics. Let's say I would want to create a CPU credits consumed chart. I can say CPU credits consumed and look at the chart for it. So over here, you can create your own charts, add in your own metrics and visualize them. So Azure monitoring provides monitoring for your Azure virtual machines. A little later in the course, we'll also learn that Azure monitoring can monitor a variety of Azure services. Most of the Azure services can be monitored by using Azure monitoring. The other important feature of a virtual machine is something called dedicated hosts. What are dedicated hosts? Dedicated hosts are physical servers which are dedicated to one customer. Typically, whenever you look at Azure, on a single host, there would be multiple virtual machines that are created. And each of these virtual machines belong to different customers. Azure ensures that these virtual machines are isolated from each other. However, Underneath the hood, they are still sharing the same hardware. They are still sharing the same host. Sometimes there are compliance needs where you need to deploy your applications only on dedicated hardware. In those kind of situations, you can go for dedicated hosts. Where can you see dedicated hosts? You can type in dedicated hosts, go to marketplace and select dedicated hosts. And this is where you can actually create a dedicated host. So you can create a dedicated host. All the virtual machines on this host are guaranteed to be belonging to you. You can create a dedicated host and then you can create virtual machines on this dedicated host. Another interesting feature in Azure Virtual Machines enables you to create cheaper temporary instances for non-critical workloads. Let's say I have a batch job Let's say it's processing 10,000 records. Let's say it processes them in batches of 100. Let's say this is not a very essential bad job. I can run it within the next couple of months. For me, the priority with this bad job is to run it as cheaply as possible. If you have bad jobs like this, which are fault tolerant, basically, if there's a failure, you'll be able to quickly recover from it. So if you have fault tolerant bad jobs, you can use Azure Spot instances to be able to run them. How can you create Azure Spot instances? Let's go to virtual machine and let's add a virtual machine. And over here, you can go in and say, I would want to create a Spot instance. So Azure Spot offers unused Azure capacity at a discounted rate versus pay-as-you-go prices. Very, very important thing is workload should be tolerant to infrastructure loss as Azure may recall capacity for these workloads. As it says in here, Azure Spot VMs allow you to take advantage of unused capacity at significant cost savings. The most important thing that you need to remember is there is no guarantees associated with the Spot virtual machines. At any point in time, Azure might want the virtual machine back 
and it would give you a 30 second notice another option that azure virtual machines provides to help you manage your costs is to reserve compute instances ahead of time you can go ahead and reserve vm instances ahead of time for one or three years you can go in here and say i would want to create a reservation so you can go and create a reservation and say i would want to add a reservation you can see that you can add reservations for a variety of services there are a lot of other services that we'll be talking about a little later for now let's focus on the virtual machine so you can select virtual machine and you can select the subscription as you can see in here reserved vm instances provide a significant discount over pay as you go vm prices this allows you to pre-purchase the base cost of your vm usage for a period of one or three years you can reserve for one or three years right now we are in the free trial subscription and that's why we will not be able to create a reserved instance but if we were in any other type of subscription you can come here you can purchase a subscription you can say i would want to have a virtual machine for three years or one year and then i would get a discount in this step we looked at some of the important features around virtual machines static ip addresses allow you to give a fixed ip address to your vm Azure monitoring helps you to monitor the metrics around your virtual machine. If you'd want a physical server which is dedicated to just one customer, you'd go for dedicated hosts. If you'd want to manage your costs with your virtual machines, you have a couple of options. You have fault tolerant workloads, then you can go for spot instances. You would want to reserve instances ahead of time, then you can go for reserved VM instances. Over here, you can reserve instances for one or three years. I'm sure you're having a wonderful time and I'll see you in the next step. Welcome back. In this step, let's look at how you can actually design good solutions with virtual machines. There are a lot of architectural characteristics that we typically talk about. Let's review them and let's see how you can achieve them using a virtual machine. Availability. Are the applications available when your users need them? If you want high availability for your virtual machines, you can create availability sets and scale sets. And you can load balance using a load balancer. Scalability. What is scalability? Scalability is all about can we handle a growth in users, traffic or data size without any drop in performance? Let's say an application has 10,000 users and let's say the number of users double very quickly. Can we handle that growth? That is what is scalability. Whenever we talk about scalability, there are two types of scaling. One is vertical scaling where you increase the hardware that is available for your instance. Instead of deploying an application to a small instance, you would deploy it to a large instance. So deploying an application or a database to a bigger instance is called vertical scaling. For example, you increase the size of your hard drive. You increase the CPU size, which is attached with your virtual machine instance. You'd want to have more RAM or CPU or IO or networking capabilities associated with your virtual machine. That is what is called vertical scaling. In Azure, for a virtual machine, you can increase the size of a virtual machine. You can go and select your virtual machine. Over here, you can go over to size. Once you go over to size, you'll be able to change the size of a virtual machine to a new size. So instead of B1S, you can choose B2S or something else. As you can see in here, whenever you change the size, the virtual machine will be restarted. However, very, very important thing to remember is that there are limits to vertical scaling. There is a maximum amount of memory that you can have on a specific system. Beyond that, you cannot increase memory. And that's why typically we go for horizontal scaling. In horizontal scaling, we deploy multiple instances of an application or a database. For example, earlier when we created a scale set, we deployed two instances of a virtual machine. Using a scale set, I can increase the number of instances to three, four or ten if, you, if I would want. So we are creating multiple virtual machine instances and we are load balancing between them using a load balancer. This is what is called horizontal scaling. Typically, horizontal scaling is preferred to vertical scaling. Why? Because vertical scaling has limits. Beyond the limit, you cannot increase the amount of CPU. Beyond the limit, you cannot increase the amount of memory. Vertical scaling can be very, very expensive as well. Buying a very, very powerful CPU might be really, really expensive. And the other important reason is horizontal scaling not only increases the performance, but also increases availability. Even if one of these instances goes down, the application can be served from the rest of the instances. However, you don't get that with vertical scaling. If you increase the size of an instance, 
If it fails, the complete application is down. However, with horizontal scaling, even if one of the instances is down, you can serve the application from the other instances. But horizontal scaling needs additional infrastructure. You need scaling sets, you need load balancers and a lot of other things. So with VMs, you can handle scalability in two ways, vertical scaling by increasing the size, horizontal scaling by using scale sets and load balancers. Typically, the type of scalability which is preferred with virtual machines is horizontal scalability. You'd want to be able to create a scale set, you'd want to be able to create a load balancer to load balance between them, and you also want to enable auto scaling so that the number of instances increases and decreases based on the load. The next architectural factor that we would consider is resilience. What is resilience? The ability of a system to provide acceptable behavior even when one or more parts of the system fail. If I have a scale set with 10 instances and let's say one of them goes down, what would happen? Will the application go down? Nope. The application will not go down because we have a load balancer. Load balancer will be able to identify that the virtual machine is down and it will not send the request to the failed machine. It will only send the request to the active virtual machines. So even if one of the parts of the system fails, we are able to provide acceptable behavior. The next important architectural consideration is geo distribution. What is geo distribution? It's all about distributing applications across multiple regions and multiple zones. With virtual machines, you can create a scale set and you can distribute the application across multiple available regions. If you want to create applications across different regions using virtual machines, then you need to create two scale sets, one in region one and the other one in region two. The next important factor to consider is disaster recovery. How do you keep your applications running in face of disasters? If an entire region fails, if an entire data center fails, how can you protect yourself? In those kind of situations, you will need to go for site recovery. What is site recovery? Inside the virtual machine, you can type in site and you can go to disaster recovery. Azure site recovery can replicate your virtual machines to another region for business continuity and disaster recovery needs. So over here, you can choose the target region. So over here, you can choose the target region and you can say start replication. I'm not going to enable that right now, but it's very, very important that you know that there is something called site recovery. Site recovery helps you with disaster recovery for virtual machines. You can set up site recovery. You can select a target region. And whenever there's an outage in the source region, the virtual machine will be deployed to the target region. The last consideration whenever we are designing good solutions is costs. You want to keep your costs as low as possible. The way you can do that is by using reservations. You can create a one year or a three year reservation as we looked at earlier. You can use spot instances if you have fault tolerant workloads, which are not immediate, which are not important right now. And you can also enable auto scaling. Increase the number of instances and decrease the number of instances based on load. This is also called elasticity. Based on the load, we are increasing or decreasing the number of instances. The last but the most important factor to consider is security. You need to always secure your VMs. We already saw that to SSH into your VM, you would need a private key. In addition, you can also improve the security of your VMs by going for dedicated hosts. A little later in the course, we'll also look at how you can create your own virtual networks and how you can create network security groups and further secure your virtual machines. In this step, we looked at how you can design good solutions with virtual machines. We looked at the different factors to consider and we looked at some of the important features in Azure VMs which can help. I'm sure you're having a wonderful time and I'll see you in the next step. Welcome back. In this step, let's look at a few scenarios related to virtual machine. How can you automatically scale up and scale down VMs? We can use scale sets and we can enable auto scaling. How can you protect VMs from data center failures? I have a set of virtual machines. Even if a specific data center fails, I don't want the entire application to go down. How can we do that? What we can do is to deploy them to multiple availability zones to protect from a single data center failure, you can deploy to multiple availability zones. So even if one of the data centers in an availability zone fails, you can serve the application from another availability zone. 
how much availability do you get by deploying two or more virtual machines in two or more availability zones in the same region? We already discussed about this. It's 99.99%. How can you perform disaster recovery for your VMs? We looked at it as well, site recovery. You can use site recovery to configure a secondary region. And whenever there's a problem with the primary region, you would have disaster recovery performed and the VM would be copied over to the second region. How can you reduce your cost for your VMs? We looked at a few options. Auto scaling, which is elasticity, reserved and spot instances. Another factor that you need to typically consider when you talk about cost is selecting the right region. One of the important things to remember is that your costs for your VMs are not stable. Costs vary with time and also costs vary from region to region. Some regions might be cheap, some regions might be expensive. If I go over to virtual machines and let's say add a virtual machine, I'll choose Compute RG and let's give it a name and let's say review and create. And over here you can see that B1S is 0 0.7493 Indian rupees per hour. This is applicable to East US region. So it's 0 0.7493. Now if I go back to previous and go back to basics and let's say I would change the region. I would change it to let's say Central India and I would say review and create. You'd see that there is a change in price. This is 0 0.8069 INR per hour. There is a small change in price over here. If you'd want to see all the details around prices, the best place to go is pricing calculator. If you do a Google for Azure pricing calculator, you'd land up on this. And this is where you can configure and estimate the cost for your Azure products. So you can say like virtual machines and virtual machine is now added. I can go and say view and it would take me down to the virtual machines and you can see the cost. So you can see that for the specific configuration that we have in here, which is D2V3 Windows in West US, the compute price for pay as you go is, is about $85 per month. And let's change it to some other region. Let's just say I would change it to South India. And you can see that it increases up to $98. You can see that there is a substantial increase. As we discussed earlier, if you go for one year reserved, you get it cheaper. So you would get it for 62 US dollars. If you go for three years reserved, you would see that it is further cheap. It goes down to 39.53. So this is a good place where you can go and explore the costs related to all the services. We'll talk about pricing calculator in depth a little later as well. So to reduce the cost for your VMs, you can consider elasticity, auto scaling, reserved instances, spot instances, and making sure that you are choosing the right region for your workload. Next scenario, will you be billed if you stop a VM? The answer is yes. Even though you stop the VM, there is disk storage which is attached with your VM. You need to pay for it. And that's the reason why the best practice is to delete all the resources that are associated with your VM if you don't want to get billed. Next scenario, will two VMs of same size always cost the same? We already talked about it. The answer is no. Price changes with time and also price is different in different regions. And that's the reason why two VMs of the same size might not cost the same always. The last question is how can you know who performed a specific action on a specific VM or a scale set? The way you can do that is by using activity logs. These activity logs are kept for 90 days. Where can you look at activity logs? Let's go back to virtual machines. And let's pick up our second virtual machine. And over here, you can actually type in activity. It's right here. This is where you can go in and look at all the activity logs around that specific virtual machine. So you can see start virtual machine, deallocate, restart. So all the events, you can see them seen here. The same thing is also available on most other resources. So if I go to scale sets, virtual machine scale sets, we have a virtual machine scale set which is created and this also has an activity log. So you can see that there are a lot of activities which are logged under the activity log for the VM scale set. I'm sure you had a wonderful time talking about virtual machines 
in the last few steps. Our goal with this section was to give you a very good introduction to cloud computing with virtual machines. As you can see, setting up applications with virtual machines is not a very, very easy task. You need to configure a lot of things to get your applications running on virtual machines. And that's where we would start focusing on managed services starting next section. I'm sure you're having a wonderful time and I'll see you in the next step.